Church bells appear in a range of ways within folklore. Sometimes they continue to ring far beneath the waves in a church under the sea. Or perhaps their peeling in the darkness guides a lost traveller back to the path and away from danger. In some tales, they're also stolen by the devil or even by mermaids. Other times, though, they're stolen by people. And that's the case in Northumbrian folklore, in which the Bringburn bells apparently now ring in Durham Cathedral, which is some 37 miles to the south of the original Priory. Or do they? As with any other legends, other versions exist to place the lost church bells in the nearby River Corkett. Perhaps the water carries the ringing of bells as it winds its way through Northumberland. Either way, several tales of the Brinkburn bells resound through local folklore, including one which involves a fairy graveyard. So let's take a trip to this quiet spot in Northumberland and see what we can find in this week's episode of Fabulous Folklore. Hello there and welcome to Fabulous Folklore, the podcast for all things folklore, occult and just a bit weird. I'm your host, Icy Sedgwick, blogger, fantasy author and your guide into these rather mysterious realms. I've got some rare things to show you, so come on in, take a look around, but be careful not to touch anything. These things sometimes bite. Well, hello there, and welcome back to Fabulous Folklore with me, your host, Icy Sedgwick. It is rather warm, as I am currently recording this on Wednesday 14th of June. It is 20 degrees C, which to me is quite warm for where I live. Um, That might be quite cold for other people, but there we go. I'm sure I'll cope with it just while I'm recording. Now, we are continuing this week with the Northern Folklore Compendium. So we've already done Dancing Fairies. We did Vampires last week, which seems to have gone down quite well. And this one is about Brinkburn Priory and the legend of what happened to its bells. But Brinkburn Priory does also have fairies associated with it as well. And I have a bonus little thing for the end of the episode about some of the weird supernatural experiences that I've had at Brinkburn Priory. So there's actually quite a lot related to this little building which will be really easy to overlook if you didn't know that it was there. It is an English heritage property so it is at least being looked after and that does also make it open to visit so there you go. But I'm just going to jump right in and I'll add all the other stuff on at the end. So you may be going where on earth is this Brinkburn Priory? Well it lies around 24 miles northwest of Newcastle upon Tyne or if you're coming the other way, it's four miles southeast of Rothbury. And it sits alongside the River Corkett in the Northumberland parish of Brinkburn. And the parish itself lies to the east of the Simonside Hills, which is where we visited when we looked at the Simonside Dwarves and the Durgar. Now, it was founded by William de Bertram, Baron of Mitford, in around 1113, who dedicated it to St Peter, and Augustinian monks ran the Priory. And ten canons actually lived here at the time of the dissolution of the monasteries. Now, it was interesting trying to figure out how to describe the place. So I thought rather than me trying to write something, I'll just simply tell you what the local historian M.A. Richardson had to say about Brinkburn in 1846. And I quote, Its recluse situation, the extreme stillness, undisturbed except by birds and the murmurs of the corket, fragments of sepulchral monuments, the gloomy shade of the venerable ivy and the evergreens, with which in many parts the ruins are crowned and overgrown, give a solemnity to the place and display an agreeable combination of objects, impressively grand and picturesque, inspiring the beholder with a contemplative melancholy, end quote. That's not even the end of the description, but I thought I've got to cut it off at some point. But that is the kind of picture that Emmy Richardson is painting of Brinkburn Priory. Now, Richardson also makes the claim that, and I quote, Brinkburn Grove was probably devoted to the worship of Jupiter, ere the Christian priests in this secluded retreat begun the Holy Vespers to the Blessed Virgin, end quote. Now, he does reference Roman ruins in the area, but his heavy reliance on probably means we can't necessarily take the claim seriously. I would love nothing more than for the Priory to actually be on the site of a temple of Jupiter. But like I say, we've got no way of knowing if that is actually true or not. But again, it gives you an idea of this really peaceful, secluded spot surrounded by trees right next to the river. And that is where the Priory stands. There is another building that stands next to it now, which used to be the Monk's Refectory, which has basically got turned into a manor house. So there is plenty to see when you go. But the location itself ends up being a little bit of a double-edged sword because being so close to the Scottish border, just 20 miles away to the northwest, the monks often face the threat of raids and this is one of the things that you have to be aware of with this particular part of the country. It was really quite violent. 
So you had obviously people from England crossing over the border into Scotland and vice versa. So it was basically quite a contested piece of land for quite a while. So it wasn't a safe part of the country to live in by any stretch of the imagination. Now, I should point out that, of course, because of how remote the location in the valley of the Priory is, this was certainly helpful in keeping them hidden. Now, obviously, the value of land in the area was plummeting after a series of Scottish raids that had devastated farms and villages. But during one of these raids, the monks gathered in the Priory. Now, they knew that the raiders didn't care about divine retribution and therefore the monastery would pretty much be fair game because gold and silver were gold and silver, regardless of the source. So the monks prayed that the raiders would pass by the priory and leave them in peace. Now, in one version of the story, they watched the columns of smoke that marked the location of each raided village, and to their surprise, the columns started appearing further and further away. Apparently, their prayers had been answered. In the other version of the story, this claims that the trees around the priory were so dense that sunlight couldn't penetrate them at noon, which made it quite difficult to find the priory, so the raiders essentially passed by, having been unable to find it. Whichever version is true, the prior was obviously grateful that the raiders had passed them by, but unfortunately, one young brother, seized by both gratitude and enthusiasm, ran to rang the great bell that marked their services, because he wanted to give thanks for the escape. Which was a nice idea, but ultimately a bit of a daft one at the same time, because a smaller group of raiders were on their way to mop up after the Scots. So the prior dragged his young charge away from the rope, but it was too late. The raiders had heard the bell and used the sound to find their way to Brinkburn Priory. Now the monks fled across the river Cocot, hoping to find safety in the woods, and when the raiders arrived, they essentially just plundered the abandoned priory because the monks obviously hadn't had time to carry much with them, and they were essentially looking for plunder rather than anything else. But the bell was the greatest victim of the raid. No one really knows for certain what happened, but it did somehow end up in the river. And there's actually a sculpture commemorating the Brinkburn Bells actually at Brinkburn Priory. Now, some tales suggest that the raiders had started a fire and then as the flames licked high and ate through the timbers of the bell tower, the wood then gave way and the bell crashed to the bottom of the tower before rolling into the river. That is indeed plausible. Other people think that the monks returned to the Priory after the raiders had gone and in this version they take down the bell and throw it in the river as punishment for betraying them. Now, if that's the case, I really do dread to think what they did to the young monk that rang it. I don't see that one as being particularly plausible, but that is what some people suggested. And a third variation claims that the monks actually put the bell in the river to save it from future raids. And there's quite a deep part of the Corkut, which is overlooked by the bell tower of the Priory, which is known as the Bell Pool. And William Howard opted for this option in 1840, claiming that the bells were put in the pool to keep them from the reach of raiders. Now, as late as the 1880s, local children were swimming in the bell pool diving for the bell. And why wouldn't they? Because the bells were essentially considered lost treasure after all. Now, no one ever managed to reach the bells, but according to Howitt, whenever anyone does manage to find them, then they will recover the other treasures that were hidden with them. I can't help but find it a bit of a strange idea that the monks would then hide the bell for safekeeping when it wasn't actually taken by the raiders in the first place but there we go so it'd be interesting to know if the bell is indeed still there because there is another legend why Brinkburn Priory lost its bells and this one I can't help thinking is a little bit more realistic but after a series of financially inept priors ruined their funds the priory was eventually taken under the direction of the monastery at Durham and under this agreement, the Bishop of Durham would pay Brinkburn's debts and repair the damage caused by the raids. But there was one condition. The Brinkburn bells were the envy of the North, and the Bishop of Durham wanted them for his own monastery in exchange for his aid. Eventually, the Brinkburn monks agreed and workmen removed the bells from the tower. Now, in order to get from Brinkburn Priory out of the valley, you do have to follow quite a long and winding road. So while the men took the bells up the road, the horses pulling the cart went into a frenzy. No one could control them or persuade them to calm down, and during the fracas, the cart overturned and the Brinkburn bells fell into the river. The men and the monks mounted several rescue attempts, but all to no avail. It seemed that the river Corkut was going to retain its prize. So this particular version of the story would at least support the idea that the Brinkburn bells are still in the river and it actually sort of dovetails quite nicely with the previous ones in that they just simply go yes the bells are there and this is another version of how they got there. But there is actually an alternative version because of course there is this is how folklore works but in the other version 
the men got as far as the river font with the bell, which they were taken back to Durham. Now, the rivers were running faster than usual because they were swollen by heavy rainfall and the horses lost their footing in the middle of the river and the Brinkburn bells still fell into the water. Now, the monks tried to rescue the bells, but try as they might, they couldn't actually reach them and they reported the disaster back at Brinkburn. The prior sent a message to Durham to explain what had happened and the prior of Durham arrived, probably suspicious about the sudden turn of events and then the two priors rode into the river. Now it seemed this time divine assistance appeared on their side and the monks finally recovered the bells and in the Denham tracks Michael Denham ascribed this to and I quote the superior abilities of high church functionaries over humble monks end quote. And a Corkadale saying affirms that Brinkburn bells are heard at Durham and Wallace confirms that the bells ended up in Durham in his history of Northumberland. So who knows if the bells remain in the river or if they're now hanging in Durham Cathedral. Now I did obviously tell you that there were stories related to fairies in the area as well and there are lots of stories of fairies north of Hadrian's Wall. Obviously I've covered some of them on the podcast but this area is certainly no different. And there's quite a dark chasm where the Brink Burn, hence the name, flows into the River Corkett, and local law suggests that fairies are particularly fond of this spot. Now, while it's rare for a fairy to die, they do apparently use the area as a graveyard when one of their number passes on, and local tales tell of funeral processions to carry dead fairies to Brinkburn. Now, an 1888 guide to Northumberland noted Brinkburn's own grounds as the burial place of the fairies rather than the chasm, and this belief may have come from the works of local historian M.A. Richardson, who noted in 1846 that, and I quote, In the sweet precincts of the solitude of Brinkburn, the villagers point out a shady green spot as covering the graves of the tiny people, and truly a more suitable place could not have been devised as the scene of so purely poetic a belief, end quote. He doesn't really specify where the shady green spot is, which is kind of annoying, but I do think that may be where the belief has ultimately come from. Now, the fairy folklorist on their blog wonders if the peeling of the bells actually killed the fairies in the area. Now, Malcolm Green suggests that the graveyard is more about the death of the belief in fairies rather than a literal graveyard. He cites Emma Richardson again, who claimed the fairies vanished when the clergy said their prayers there, and Reverend John Horsley, who claimed in 1729 that the fairies were out of date. So in this case, as I say, it's the death of people believing in them because of the coming of Christianity that is where this idea of a graveyard comes from. Whereas I kind of prefer the idea of a literal graveyard, but that's just me. And either way, Brinkburn Priory is still a very quiet and tranquil little spot and it is easy to see why a belief in fairies would flourish in the area or even why they might choose to be buried here. And who knows, maybe they engineered the fall of the Brinkburn Bells into the river to actually get some peace. Now, I do highly recommend a visit to Brinkburn Priory if you are in the area because there was actually a mid-19th century restoration which really did do the place justice, which is kind of unusual for a 19th century restoration. And the church also boasts spectacular acoustics. And I do know a couple of people who have actually performed there in choirs and apparently it does sound pretty spectacular. Like I said earlier on, there's also a manor house near the church, which would have originally been the refectory, but it was converted into a house when the site was leased to Cuthbert Carnaby in 1538. Richard Hodgson bought the house in 1810 and he demolished its centre and western end and then rebuilt the house in the Tudor Gothic style in 1837. Now it is certainly an odd building to wander around even now, particularly because when you walk in at the ground level, it you can sort of see up to other floors but like the staircase that's in the main hall kind of goes up and then there's like literally no floor above you so you can't actually walk around upstairs and if you go down in the basement because it's kind of built on a bit of a hill the cellar kitchens kind of also come out into like a little yard so they're not entirely underground or they are at one end but not the other if that makes sense because they're built into this hill and I did have two instances of like really weird supernaturally kind of things happening in there and these are completely based solely on personal reaction like I didn't have any kind of equipment with me or anything other than just intuition so you can make of them what you will but I'd gone round the house and I was about to go into a particular room and there was the mother of all cold spots just outside the door and my dad being an engineer we actually kind of got him to sort of figure out like angles and stuff to see if there was anywhere that there could be a draft coming in but where it was, there was no way that that could have been a draft and why it was a very, very specific spot. So if you literally kind of stood in it, it was really, really cold, like demonstrably colder than the air around it. And if you stepped to either side, it warmed up again. So you think if it was a draft, there would be 
kind of a continuous line you could follow, not just one little bit. It was really bizarre. And then that same visit, I'd gone down into the kitchens and they're a weird room anyway, to be completely honest with you. But at the one end of the room, they've got these two cells in the corner and they're really dark. So already you're kind of primed with, oh my God, what's in there? And I happened to look at the one sort of nearest the outside. So it's actually the one which is near where there's actually daylight coming in. So it wasn't completely in the dark. And I just remember having this overwhelming sense of there being something there that really did not want me in that room. So me being me, I was like, do you know what? I'm not that bothered about seeing the cellars after all. I'm just going to go back upstairs. And I, I, I have been down there again since then. Didn't really have the same sort of sensation this time. But it was certainly very strange. Was it supernatural? Was it just psychological? Who knows? I just thought I would put it in there just to kind of show how this is a bit of a strange area. And it is beautifully peaceful and really lovely to wander around if you're in the area and then you have something like that happen and you're a bit like oh oh what's going on here the fact that the building has been so heavily remodeled as well also makes it quite interesting because then you think well I have no idea what that would even relate to but it's just worthwhile knowing like I say really worth visiting as it is English heritage so they do have like a little kiosk and whatnot and so on there as well it doesn't have the same kind of facilities as most places like you know in terms of like cafes and things like that but if you sort of want to just have a bit look around you want somewhere nice and peaceful that's generally not massively crowded as well highly recommend it and if you want to go looking for fairy graveyards by all means let me know and if you do find them obviously again by all means let me know so that is the end of this week's episode. Next week, we're going to have a look at red caps, which I was convinced I'd already done an episode on, but apparently no, I haven't. So I can have a look at them because they are really vicious and they are probably the member of the fairy family that I would definitely least like to encounter. So we're going to have a look at them for the end of June. So as always, thank you very much for listening. If you do enjoy the podcast, feel free to leave a review because that basically tells the different websites that it's a podcast that somebody enjoys. So it's more likely to recommend it to other people. And then that just helps to get the word out so that there's more of us kind of like looking into these kind of things. And it's a really, really easy, free way to help the podcast as well. Obviously, if you want to financially contribute by either becoming a patron or buying me a coffee, that is appreciated. But like I say, word of mouth is actually genuinely priceless. So tell a friend, share the posts online or leave a review. Whichever one of those is most accessible to you and I very much appreciate all of them because as I say, it just means that more people will be able to look into these things too. So anyway, I hope you have a marvellous week ahead and I will see you next week when we have a look at red caps. Cheerio. Well, thanks for listening and I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you did, feel free to leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts because that helps other people find the show too. It also takes between four and six hours to research, write, record and edit these episodes. So if you want to help support my time in doing that, then you can buy me a coffee or you can join the Fabulous Folklore family on Patreon and enjoy extra benefits, including exclusive episodes and articles and even illustrated talks. All the links you need are below and thanks in advance.